So it is my pleasure to introduce Paul Cristiano. Paul works on AI alignment at OpenAI. Previously, he received a PhD in learning theory from UC Berkeley. He is on the board of AUT, and he writes about alignment at AIalignment.com. That's AI-alignment.com. He's here today to speak about his current work in AI alignment. Please give a warm welcome to Paul Cristiano. I should remind everybody as well that we probably will have a few minutes for Q&A at the end, so use your Bizabo app to submit those questions. Cool, great to be here. Um, when I was preparing this talk, I initially intended and perhaps advertised a talk that was a survey of current work ongoing in AI alignment. As I was thinking about how to give the talk, I think I came to the view that it would be more useful to instead describe sort of some of the pieces of AI alignment as I see it, how they fit together, and how they relate to the broader project of making AI go well. Um, so I apologize to anyone who's profoundly disappointed by the change of topic. Anyone who saw me speak on Thursday, this might be very redundant, and I won't be offended if you disappear now and might recommend it. But with that said, let's dive in. Um, so I'm interested broadly in the problem of making humanity's long-term future good by our lights. Um, I'm zooming in on this sub-problem of the effects of AI on our long-term future. So I'm interested in the problem of making AI have a positive long-run impact. Um, but even within that problem, there's sort of a large number of different sub-problems that we can think about separately, and I think are worth having some conceptual clarity and distinctions. Uh, so that's why there's a lot of empty space on this slide. Um, so I guess the part of the problem I most think about is what I call alignment. I use alignment in a slightly different way from other people. I apologize for the conceptual confusion. What I mean by alignment, I'm gonna call intent alignment. That's trying to build AI systems that are trying to do what you want them to do. So in some sense, this might be like the minimal thing you'd want out of your AI, at least it is trying. Um, so that's what I mean by intent alignment, and that's one of these pieces, or one piece, of making AI have a positive long-run impact. Right, so we want to avoid the situation where AI is working at cross-purposes to us. We want to avoid the situation where as our AI systems become more competent, they're more effectively doing stuff we do not want them to do. We want them to at least be trying. So this is one driver of AI going well over the long term. There are a lot of other problems we could work on with the same kind of intention. So another category of work is making AI more competent. Right? So some forms of competence are mostly important over the short run, but even if we're sort of exclusively focused on the long run, there are kinds of competence we care about. So an example is we would like our AI systems to perform reliably. Right? That is, if I have a system which is well-meaning, that doesn't mean the system is reliable. And if my system makes mistakes, those can potentially be very bad. So if I'm interested in the deployment of AI in high-stakes situations, it's if I imagine the AI system, which is like making decisions about nuclear weapons, I might think it's really important for that system to not mess up. I think this is a really important problem, but it's worth separating from the problem of building AI that's trying to do what we want it to do. I think some techniques apply to both, but again, it's worth zooming in on one of those problems and asking how can we solve this one. Um, yeah, I think this is the kind of problem we might hope will get better as our AI systems become more competent. So as AI improves, AI systems are better at understanding the world, they're better at sort of doing what they're trying to do. We hope that like not making mistakes is in that category. Again, there's separate research, but it's distinct from this problem of trying to do the right thing. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a few more examples of competence that one could work on from the perspective of trying to make the long run impacts of AI positive. Um, I'm sort of choosing the examples that feel closest to intent alignment to be clearest about what doesn't fall under this heading of intent alignment. Again, because I think having that distinction in mind is helpful for thinking about work in that area. So another example that's maybe a little bit more surprising is having your AI understand humans well. Right? So that is, there's this potential distinction between a system that is well-meaning, that is a system which is trying to do what I want it to do, and a system that knows me well. Um, like if I imagine hiring an assistant, I could have an assistant who is trying to do the right thing, but maybe doesn't understand me very well, or we don't have really high bandwidth communication. And this is another important but separate problem. Right, that is, there's a distinction between an AI that's trying to get what I want and an AI that really understands what I want well. And I mostly work on the well-meaning side of this rather than the knows-me-well side. And one of the hopes that motivates that focus for me is that you don't need a super deep understanding of what humans want in order to avoid catastrophically bad outcomes. Right, so if I imagine a scenario where an AI system is like actively working against humans, uh, like tiling the universe with paper clips in the absurd example, like the very extreme case, but maybe in lesser cases, sort of not allowing human space to like get what they want, to figure out what they want, and then ultimately get it. Right? Avoiding that case involves sort of a minimal understanding of what it is that humans want. It involves understanding that humans don't want to be killed. Humans don't want you to like take all their stuff and go run off. These are like important facts, but maybe facts that we hope on this like overall progress towards sophisticated AI happen kind of early. 
Um, so for philosophers, I guess when I say that an AI is trying to do what I want, I'm sort of using that phrase de dicto rather than de re. That is, it's trying to do what Paul wants. It's not trying to do the thing that Paul in fact wants. Okay, so that's another example of competence, which I think is important, which I want to keep separate. Another example that's maybe surprising is the distinction between making our AI good and having our AI help us make subsequent AI systems good. <coughs> right, so that is, we're sort of dealing with this handoff to AI systems right now. We're going to be building AI systems. We're going to be making some decisions on our behalf. That AI system we build will be helping us design future AI systems, or at some point on its own designing future AI systems, and it will face its own similar problems as it does subsequent handoffs. So you can imagine a case where we have built an AI that's doing what we want. That AI system we build messes up and builds another AI system that's not doing what it wants. And I'm again distinguishing this problem from the challenge we face right now in this very first handoff. And I'm thinking about just this very first handoff. Um, these problems are similar. So in the same way that I'm doing research that I hope will help future humans build AI systems that are aligned with their interests, I also hope that that research will help future AI systems build subsequent AI systems that are aligned with their interests. Um, but I think that our cognitive work right now can sort of quickly become obsolete once we're thinking about systems much more sophisticated than us. And so I'm really focusing on this challenge, sort of the first challenge we face, the first step of this dynamic. Okay, so these are all in the category of making AI capable. I think sort of separating these from alignment is important to expressing why like, I view alignment as this sort of well-scoped problem that I'm optimistic we can totally solve. It's partly because I'm willing to say that's like a narrower problem than the overall problem of making AI go well. Um, and many of these problems on the competence side I sort of hope will get better as AI improves. I'm sort of picking alignment in part because I think it's the aspect of the problem that's most likely to not get better as AI improves. Um, there's a whole another category of work. Like, rather than changing the way my AI behaves, or like changing what my AI does, I can also try and cope with impacts of AI systems. So as an example, um, AI systems may enable new destructive capabilities. I might say that requires new approaches to governance. Like maybe it makes us make better bombs or make really big bombs more cheaply. Maybe it allows us to like, design bioweapons, something along these lines. That might require governance changes, but I want to keep those separate from work on the character of AI. Similarly, like it could cause shifts in the balance of power. Um, it can enable certain kinds of misuse. So maybe criminals currently have a hard time coordinating, but this becomes easier in a world where it requires only capital. Or maybe totalitarian regimes have an easier time sort of remaining in power without supportive people if more and more tasks are automated. Um, and there's a lot of dot, dot, dots in this graph because all of these nodes are sort of covering only a very small part of the total possible space. I think these are some of the big areas that people work on um, between making your AI more competent, making your AI align so it's at least trying to do the right thing, coping with impacts of AI, these are all like different projects that one can engage in to try and make AI go well. So I think once I've said so many things are not AI alignment, maybe a natural question is how could we even possibly fail at this problem? Like what could go wrong? Um, an example of a thing that could go wrong is when we train ML systems, we often use some measurable objective to say which policies are doing better or worse. And you may end up with AI systems that instead of trying to do what I want are trying to optimize the kinds of measurable objectives that I use during training. So that's an example of a possible failure. Right? So if what I want is not measurable, I may have this constraint imposed by the nature of the technology, which causes me to not have systems that are trying to do what I want. Another possible failure is that there might be different kinds of values that behave well on the historical cases I used to train an AI system, and so there might be this degeneracy. ML might give me, in some sense, like a random draw from some distribution of values, and I might be unhappy because most random draws of values maybe aren't mine. Um, that's like a little bit of intuition about how we could possibly fail at the intent alignment problem, even if in some sense it feels like I've set almost everything to the side. All of my work essentially is focused on this problem, intent alignment. I'm going to sort of zoom in more. We've left a lot of blank space at the bottom. So to think about dividing this problem further, I'm going to use an abstraction. I think this comes from Eliezer, though I'm not sure. I like this notion of an alignment tax. At least the language comes from Eliezer. What I mean by this is, Sort of everyone would prefer have AI systems that are trying to do what they want them to do. I want my AI to try and help me. Um, the reason I might compromise is if there's some tension between having an AI that's robustly trying to do what I want and having an AI that is competent or intelligent. And the alignment tax is intended to capture that gap, that cost that I incur if I insist on alignment. So you might imagine that I have two actors, Alice and Bob. Alice really wants to have an AI that is trying to do what she wants it to do. Bob is just willing to have an AI that makes as much money as it possibly can. You might think that even if making money is an instrumental sub-goal for Alice of getting what she wants, Alice wants her AI to make more money in the service of helping her achieve what she wants, Alice faces some overhead from insisting that her AI is actually trying to do exactly what she wants, and the alignment tax captures that overhead. So the best case 
is a world where we have no alignment tax, and in that world there's sort of no tension and no reason for anyone to ever deploy an AI that's not aligned. Um, the worst case is that there's no, we sort of have no way of building aligned AI, and so Alice is reduced to just doing things herself by hand, and that world is maybe a giant alignment tax, sort of all the value of AI. I mean, in, the real, in reality, we're probably gonna be somewhere in between those two extremes. So we could then imagine these two approaches to making AI systems aligned. One is reducing the alignment tax, making it so that Alice has to incur less of a cost if she insists on her AI being aligned, and the other is paying the alignment tax. So if I say I just accept that it's gonna be harder to build aligned AI, I could just pay that cost, or people could pay that cost. I'm mostly gonna be talking about reducing the alignment tax, but just to provide a little bit of color and flushing out like the space of options for paying the alignment tax, you can imagine that one class of strategies is just caring enough to pay the tax. So if you're an AI developer or if you're an AI consumer, you could pay some cost in order to use aligned AI, and that's like a way that you can make the long-term future better. You could also try and influence like what people are in a position to make those choices. So you could hope that there are more people who care more about the long-term future in a position where they're making these calls. Um, or you could hope that make those people care more. Another option is to try and coordinate. So if Alice and Bob are in this position, they would both prefer have AI systems that are doing what they want, but maybe they place this trade-off, they could just both agree. Alice could say, look, Bob, I will only deploy an AI that's not doing exactly what I want if you deploy such an AI. If we just both keep insisting on aligned AIs, we're sort of back where we started, roughly, and um, maybe that can make the alignment tax less painful. You can imagine there, there's some work on like designing agreements that people might sort of might make it less painful to pay this tax, and then enforcing those agreements. Um, so on the other side, this is what I mostly focus on, how we can sort of do technical work that reduces the alignment tax. You could imagine several different kinds of approaches to this problem. I'm gonna talk about two. So one is the idea of having some view about which algorithms are easier or harder to align. So for example, I might have a view that's like, we could either build AI by having systems which perform inference and models that we understand, that have like interpretable beliefs about the world and then act on those beliefs, or I could build systems by having opaque black boxes and doing optimization over those black boxes. I might have the view that like the first kind of AI is easier to align, so one way that I could make the alignment tax smaller is just by advancing that kind of AI which I expect to be easier to align. Right, so this is not a super uncommon view amongst academics. It's also, I guess, maybe familiar here because it, it describes Miri's view. Miri sort of takes this outlook of like some kinds of AI just look hard to align. We wanna build the understanding such that we can build the kind of AI that is easier to align. That's actually not the approach I'm gonna be talking about, or like not the perspective I normally take. I normally instead ask a question that's more like, let's just suppose that we had this kind of algorithm. Suppose that we had the black boxes. Is there some way that we can design a variant of those algorithms that's alignable? So that captures or works about as well as the original unaligned algorithm, but is aligned. So to be a little bit more precise about that, I sort of view the goal of most of my research as starting with an algorithm X that's potentially unaligned, e.g. like deep reinforcement learning, and trying to design a new algorithm, a line of X, which is intent aligned, nearly as useful as X, and scales as well as X. Right, so this is sort of the situation I'd like to be in. If you're in this situation, then Alice, who wants to have aligned AI, can just do the same thing as Bob, but every time Bob would use this potentially unaligned algorithm X, Alice instead uses align X. It's kind of the world I want to get to. I think that the salient feature of this plan is something is like this idea of scalability. So you could imagine you sort of have two options for aligning AI. One is that as AI improves, we continue to do ongoing work to ensure AI is aligned. Um, and the alignment tax then consists of how much extra work do we have to do to make these alignable AIs state of the art. And the second approach would be to scalably solve alignment for a particular algorithm. So I could say, I don't care how good maybe deep reinforcement learning gets, I know that regardless, I can sort of turn the crank on this transformation, end up with an aligned version, and now the alignment tax depends on the overhead of that transformation. So I think in general, option two is sort of great if it's possible, but it's very unclear if it's possible. Maybe this depends on sort of how broad I mean how broad a category I mean by algorithm. So I'm not hoping to have a solution which works for any possible kind of AI algorithm. I'm sort of going to look at particular algorithms and say, can I form an aligned version of this algorithm and hope that I sort of, as new algorithms appear, I'm able to align them. So maybe in that category, the problem now breaks up by the type of algorithm I want to align. Right, so for example, I'm gonna talk about planning as an algorithmic ingredient. So I, an agent can plan in the sense of searching over actions or spaces of actions to find actions that are anticipated to have good effects and then taking the actions that it predicts will have good effects. That's like an algorithm. It's a really simple algorithmic building block. It introduces potential alignment if there's a mismatch between what I want and the standard which an AI uses to evaluate predicted effects. Also potentially introduces mismatches like if there's some implicit decision theory in that planning algorithm which I think doesn't capture the right way of making decisions and so on. So I then have this problem of can I find a version of planning which is just as useful as like the planning I might have done otherwise but is now aligned and scales just as well. 
Similarly, there's this nice algorithm deduction where I sort of start from a set of premises and then use valid inference rules to come up with new beliefs. And I might ask, is there some version of deduction that avoids alignment failures? Maybe the alignment failures and deduction are a little bit more subtle. I won't be talking about them. And then another algorithm which sort of looms large right now and is the main subject in my research is learning, which is kind of like planning but at the meta level. So instead of searching over actions to find one that's good, I'm gonna have some way of evaluating is a possible policy good, e.g. by like playing a bunch of games with that policy and seeing does it win? And then I'm going to search over policies, e.g. like over weights for my neural network to find a policy which performs well and I'm gonna use that one for making decisions in the future. So that's what I mean by learning. And this again introduces this challenge of is there some way to take that algorithm, which is potentially unaligned, and make an aligned version of learning. And that's what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time. That's like the focus of my research. I think I'm gonna again borrow from Miri and talk about some distinction in this problem, which I think is important and really helps organize thinking between outer alignment and inner alignment. So roughly speaking, what I mean by outer alignment is finding an objective that incentivizes aligned behavior. So when I do learning, I had some way of evaluating which policies are good and which policies are bad, and I pick a policy which is good according to that objective. A first part of the problem is designing that objective so that it captures what I care about well enough that a policy that actually performs well on the objective is actually good. So here my failure mode looks something like, you, know, you get what you measure, or like Goodhart's law, where I have behavior that's not in fact good, but looks good according to this proxy that I'm using. It looks good according to the standard I'm using to evaluate. Um, so for example, I have an advisor, that advisor is giving me advice, maybe I pick policies for getting advice based on how good the advice looks that they produce, and I end up with bad advice that's just optimized to look good to me. That's like the failure mode for outer alignment, and now the problem is designing an objective that captures what I want well enough. There's a second half of the problem, which is maybe a little bit more subtle, um, which would refer to as inner alignment, which is making sure that the policy that we end up with is robustly pursuing the objective that we use to select it. So what I mean by this is, well, maybe I'll start with the analogy. Again, this is an analogy Miri likes a lot, where humans were selected over lots of generations to produce large numbers of descendants. But in fact, humans are not primarily motivated day to day by having lots of descendants. So humans, instead of this complicated mix of values, we care about like art and joy and flourishing and so on, which happen to be well enough correlated on the evolutionary environment that becoming better at pursuing the things we want caused us to have more descendants. But if you put a human in some very novel situation, they won't keep taking the actions that promote having the maximum number of descendants. They're like conditions under, humans, under which humans would say, like, look, this action will cause me to have more descendants, but I don't care. It will be like really unfun. I'm gonna do the fun thing instead. From our perspective, that's good, because we like fun. From evolution's perspective, maybe that's a bummer if it was like trying to get very large numbers of descendants. And so you can imagine facing a similar problem in the learning setting. So I selected a policy which performed well on the distribution, but it may be the case that that policy is trying to do something, right, there might be different policies which are different values which lead to reasonably good behavior on the training distribution, but then cause in some new situation to do something different from what I want. That's what I mean by inner alignment. Um, again, my research mostly focuses on outer alignment, but I'm gonna say a little bit about the techniques I'm most excited about for inner alignment. So one example is adversarial training. So here the idea is, if I'm concerned that my system may fail in some cases that are unlike the cases that appear during training, I can ask an adversary to construct cases on which my system is particularly likely to fail and then train on those. Um, and then we can just sort of repeat this loop. Every time I have a new agent, I ask my adversary, okay, now come up with a situation where this would fail. So the notion of fail here is sort of a free parameter that we can choose. In the case of alignment, fail means it's not trying to do what we want. That would be a failure of alignment. And we're going to ask the adversary to generate cases where the system isn't trying to do what we want. In practice today, fail most often means something like the behavior of your model is sensitive to a small perturbation of the input. But the basic idea is the same between these two cases. There's an open question of like how much the techniques which help in one case will help in the other. Um, but the basic framework, the schema is the same. And this is a topic which is you know, sort of an active focus of research and machine learning. Not normally from the alignment perspective, normally from this robustness, reliability perspective, of finding a system which works well reliably. There are other possible approaches. So another is, I would sort of like to understand what the policy I've learned is doing. If I understand that, sort of even in a very crude way, I could hope to be able to see like, ah, this policy is getting a good objective on the training distribution, but in fact would do something very weird in different conditions. It's like not really trying to optimize the objective, and so in some strange situation it would do something contrary to my interests, or some novel situation. And again, people mostly study that question today in the context of, it would sure be nice to understand something about what these models we're learning are doing. 
but the same kinds of research they're doing, you could hope, will be helpful for understanding, is this learned model doing something bad? Would it potentially do something bad in a novel situation? Um, another example is verification, where instead of just considering the behavior of my policy on particular examples, I can try and sort of have inputs, or I can try and quantify over possible inputs. Um, I can try and test, like, is there a situation, directly test, is there a situation where this would do badly, or can I demonstrate that it does well in every case? Okay. Like I said, I mostly work on outer alignment. And here again, I'm gonna make another pairwise distinction, dividing the problem into two pieces, sort of the easy half and the hard half, or like the, the warm up and full problem, it depends how you wanna look at it. One setting is the case where we have access to some expert that understands the task we want our AI to do very well. So imagine I have some teacher who is able to demonstrate the intended behavior, is able to evaluate the intended behavior, understands what the AI should be doing. Um, in this case, we have lots of, lots of options for constructing an objective that will cause our AI to do the right thing. Right? So one option is I could draft, just choose policies that produce behavior that looks very similar to the teacher's behavior. So if I have a teacher that does what I want, I want to get an agent that does what I want, I'll just loop over agents until I find one that seems to do the same kind of thing the agent does, or the teacher does. Another option is to just have the teacher say, like I have my, my policy I'm training, I have my agent who's trying to learn, I can have my teacher look at its behavior and say that was good or that was bad, and then search for policies that produce behaviors the teacher thinks are good. And sort of both the cases of imitation and learning from feedback, maybe one of my main difficulties is I have access to a teacher, but I want to be able to efficiently use the data the teacher provides. Maybe the teacher's expensive each time I run them. And this is the kind of difficulty that looms really large in the case where I already have an expert who's able to do the task. Being efficient about how I use that expert's time, being careful about like how that gets transmitted to the agent. Another option is IRL, so trying to look at the behavior of the teacher and infer what values or what preferences the teacher seems to be satisfying, and then use those. So take those and ask an agent to optimize those. Which you could sort of view imitation and learning from feedback as special cases of some more general paradigm. This is gonna involve some assumption that relates the preferences of the teacher to their behavior, e.g. like an approximate optimality assumption. Right, so I said that the sort of easier case is the one where we have a teacher and the teacher is able to exhibit or understand the intended behavior. The case we care about in the long run is one where we want to build AI systems that are able to make decisions that a human couldn't make or that understand things about their situation that no available teacher understands. And so the case of learning from a teacher is maybe practically the more immediately relevant one. Right? We have humans who are very good at doing tasks. Today we mostly want our AI systems to do what humans do but cheaper. Um, in the long run, we care a lot about, as, from the perspective of long run alignment risk, we care a lot about the case where we want to do things that a human couldn't have done or a human can't understand. So maybe this is more like a domain that people concerned about long run impacts focus on relative to people who care about practical applicability. So I'm gonna talk about three different approaches to this problem, which again, not exhaustive. So one approach that I think is maybe the most common implicit expectation of people in the ML community is to treat the case where you have a teacher as like a training set and then to try and train a model that's going to extrapolate from that data to the case where you don't have access to a teacher. So you hope that if your model generalizes in the right kind of way, or if you train it on a sufficiently broad distribution of cases, it will learn the right thing and extrapolate. Um, I'm not gonna say much about this. I'm like very scared of this. I think like the record so far is not super great on this kind of extrapolation. Um, but I think it's a reasonable thing to ask, like might this be very different as our AI systems get more intelligent? Another option would be to treat the learning from teacher case as a warm up, to take the same kind of approach. So we could do inverse reinforcement learning in the learning from teacher case where we try and back out what their values were. We could also try and do that in a case where we're going far beyond the teacher and say, can we infer what the teacher actually wanted in some deeper sense? Can we understand which of the teacher's behaviors are artifacts of what they want versus what they value? Can we pull those apart and then say, now we're gonna get what they want but without the limitations the teacher had? Again, I think this is sort of a plausible project but it looks really hard right now. And then a third approach, which maybe also looks hard, but is the one I'm most excited about and most focused on, is to treat learning from a teacher as a building block and say, supposing we could solve that problem well, is there some way we can use that to directly get what we want in the long term? So in that, we might say, if we could just build a sequence of better teachers, then we can train a sequence of better and better agents without ever having to actually go beyond the behavior of the teacher. So the idea here is we're asking where can we get a better teacher? Where can we get a teacher who understands enough to train the agent? And one place we can get traction is the hope that if you take 10 people, they can solve harder problems than one person can solve. So if you have 10 people and you ask them to like decompose a problem, break it into pieces, divide up the work, they can solve problems that would have been beyond, at least slightly beyond the abilities of a single person. And we could hope that the same applies to the AI systems we train. So sort of a cartoonish caricature would be 
rather than taking our initial teacher to be one human and saying, let's learn from that one human to behave as well as a human, we start by learning from a group of humans. And we say, great, is there some way we can have this group do more sophisticated stuff than one human could do? Now we can have an AI which is not human level, but is the level of like a human group. And then we can try and sort of take that as our building block and recurse, like iterate on that procedure. So now we can form a group of these AI systems. Each AI was already as good as a human group. Maybe this group of AIs is now better than any group of humans, or it's as good as like a much larger group of humans. And I can use that as the teacher to train another AI system. And I'm sort of, if this dynamic consistently goes in the right direction, so if putting together this group is smarter, this group does more what we want than the individual, then I can hope to just train a sequence of better and better AI systems, which continue to do what we want, continue to be aligned with like their original intention. Okay, so this is a broad overview of sort of how I see the alignment problem, different parts of the alignment problem relating to each other and how they fit into the bigger picture. There's gonna be, I think, especially tomorrow, a bunch of talks about technical alignment topics. Um, so I think at 1 p.m., Miri's having office hours. Miri's like in this bucket, or I put them in this bucket. Maybe if anyone from Miri's in the audience, they can object. Uh, of the, like advancing alignable algorithms, Rob's giving me a thumbs up. That is trying to understand, instead of just accepting that we're gonna have these crazy opaque black boxes, let's try and just like push on like different approaches that don't go through the same potential risks. Um, Chris Ola, a colleague from OpenAI, is gonna be talking about transparency. So how can we look inside neural nets and understand what they do? Um, Andreas Stuhlmiller from Ott is going to be talking about this case where we want to surpass human experts. So how can we delegate cognitive work when we can't evaluate the outputs? And this is going to be very similar to sort of the perspective I'm taking here. And then at 5 p.m., Jeffrey Irving and Amanda Askell, also colleagues from OpenAI, are going to be talking about sort of debate as a strategy for surpassing human experts, where we ask a human not to do work but to evaluate, given two conflicting claims or two experts who are both trying to do the work, which of them is doing it better? Can we have them like check each other's errors? So those are a bunch of things on the docket for tomorrow which I think fit into this picture in different ways. And when I'm thinking about these kinds of issues, it's really helpful for me to have sort of a big picture in mind of how things hook together, what the separate problems are and how they relate. Cool. So that's all I have to say and I think that leaves us just a few minutes for questions. But thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, First question, since you mentioned Eliezer, my understanding of his kind of personal trajectory going through these sorts of problems was to get kind of stuck on what humans want and even if that is, uh, you know, and wonder if that is even a coherent, uh, if there is a coherent answer to that or if what humans want is sort of inherently contradictory and, and thus sort of not really answerable by systems. I mean, you blew right past that. So are you not worried about that or do you, how do you think about that problem? Yeah, so I guess in this talk I sort of zoomed in enough that I left many parts of the tree really unfleshed out. Um, and in particular I didn't talk at all about like how you actually, sort of any of the ambiguity and like what humans want or like doing what who wants. Um, I think those are important questions. I don't currently feel like they're the central difficulties or at least central difficulties to be resolved by like someone with me with the kind of perspective I'm taking. Um, I think Eliezer is probably in like a broadly similar place. But I think now maybe he'd be more, he sort of treats it as like hazardous to focus on that aspect of the problem and would more talk about like, look, you want an ad that's just gonna like make you a sandwich. Can you have an ad that's like really just trying to make you a sandwich as well as it possibly can just to get at it. I think he also thinks that's like the most likely step to fail. Like is your AI even trying to do like basically the right kind of thing? Um, which is related I think maybe in the context of systems like deep learning systems he's very concerned about like this kind of inner alignment case or like the way in which humans are just not even like vaguely trying to do what evolution wanted to the extent that you view evolution as like something trying, like building humans. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously can't speak for Eliezer, but that's sort of a rough take. A uh, couple of questions that have come in from the app. Uh, one person's wondering, do you think it is possible to give AIs the ability to understand humans very well without also giving them the capability to make things go very badly? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of subtle questions and trade-offs in like the rest of this tree. Like what capabilities do you think are good versus bad capabilities? I think some people would have the view that like this understanding humans thing is actually like on net negative because sort of it puts them like compared to helping us resolve some kinds of problems, it like gives them more ability to influence the world or the trajectory of civilization. I don't have a strong view on that. I think I'm sort of persuaded by the prima facie case that like if you're trying to build a system to help you, like it seems good for it to more understand what you want. Um, I'd say that's like, again, sort of not the aspect of the problem I've been focusing on. Um, in significant part because I'm sort of optimistic that both on the bad, for better or worse, like very sophisticated AI systems will understand humans well enough to like be able to, yeah, both push the world in various directions and also understand at least very crudely what we want. 
Okay. Another question uh, from the audience. You mentioned that the track record for AIs extrapolating from a teacher is not great. Can you give some examples of where that's fallen down? Uh, yeah, so I guess in deep learning, some people care a lot about training a system on one kind of case and then having it work immediately on a new kind of case. Um, and I'd say our record so far has not been great on that. And the big question, by, okay, so what I mean by, what are cases? Like, a very dumb case is sort of learning algorithms, like have, do you have an AI that sorts a list? If you want your AI to sort a list and you do it in like an end-to-end -end way, you just say, great, it's gonna be a big neural network, takes this input one list, produces another list, you're like probably not, basically not going to see generalization from like a thing that sorts lists of length, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30, 64, 128. If you're then trying to run on 256, it's just gonna like go crazy. Um, you sort of have to make kind of strong architectural assumptions or like you have, to, you have to really impose something about the structure of the task into the model in order to have that kind of generalization occur. Um, that's like one example. I think like in general people have been surprised and like one of the big criticisms of deep learning is that it like doesn't do, sort of you train it in one case, it works well in that case. It doesn't tend to work well yet in other cases. And again, the big question is just like is that, is that sort of fundamental? Is that like a thing that techniques will always have or is that something that will go away as they become more powerful and as they get closer to like transformative AI? Awesome. Well, for more on these questions, you'll have to track Paul down at office hours, I believe you'll have later yeah, today. I think so, at 3. At 3 p.m., perfect. Uh, how about a round of applause for Paul Cristiano? Thanks again.